am very from med piper so on behalf of med piper and gentlemen uh, i'd like to thank you all uh, to the respected speaker and to all the attendees uh, to join us on this session uh, on case presentations in cardiology so i'd like to uh, hand it over to dr abhi next to take over thank you so much dr vedi uh, good evening everybody and welcome to all of you and uh, this is our cardiovascular session that is happening and for formally invite you all and to deliver the open opening remarks i request dr gomati subramaniam the state kerala ira president ma'am kindly deliver the opening remarks and also the welcome speech okay uh, good evening to all of you uh, i am very happy that uh, we have our jonomed For, as a platform starting today for our academic session and uh, i welcome i mean i uh, welcome all the uh, residents the faculty and uh, the uh, ira kerala office bearers uh, for this academic session the, this session is uh, going to be a good one because it is coming from narayana hridaya bank and we have a very good eminent faculty who is going to talk to you with her uh, residents and who are uh, post dm md students doing their fellowships i welcome all please be alive and keep your eye open to see the cases provided by dr bicha over to you dr avni thank you so much ma'am uh, the sessions we have found that pgs the finding these sessions very useful because they learn it in a format that they are going to present the format the kind of questions they will get and the pattern that they should be following not just uh, learning educational points but also from the pg perspective so we have found that we are getting very good reviews about these sessions so we are very happy currently this month we are dealing with cardiovascular session and like dr gomuthi already mentioned we have a really eminent faculty in cardiothoracic radiology we have very few of them cardiothoracic radiologists actually so today we have with us dr richa kothari who has done her level 3 uh, cardiovascular magnetic resonance certification from the european association of cardiovascular imaging she is working as a consultant cardiothoracic radiologist at narayana institute of cardiac sciences bangalore and uh, as obviously with her certifications we know her areas of expertise are cardiac ct and mr thoracic and vascular imaging in everything in the adults and pediatrics both she had uh, got received the regional award by the european association of cardiovascular imaging in the year 2018 in barcelona spain she has been a both co-author for multiple textbook chapters a speaker at various national and international conferences she has conducted several cardiac imaging cmes and workshops for doctors and technicians too she is a winner of multiple research presentations at national and international level and she is an executive uh, mem committee member of indian association of cardiac imaging and part of the dnb teaching program a pretty impressive bio so we are really looking forward to it she has uh, two pgs with her today dr karthik and dr prerna so over to you dr risha for the session thank you very much for the very kind introduction i would like to thank the iri kerala state iri for uh, giving us this platform and welcoming us uh, to present our cases thank you very much sp dr gumpi and dr avni thank you for your support uh, just a little bit of about narayana and our team uh, we have a dedicated cardiac building and a dedicated radiology unit for especially cardiac imaging on an average we do 25 to 30 cardiac cts and 12 to 13 cardiac mrs daily uh we have a dedicated team who reports these uh, so head of the team is dr vimal raj he is my immediate boss um, and then it's me and we usually have multiple fellows so today with me i have two of my fellows who will be presenting these cases to you uh we have dr karthik who is a relatively a fresher he is post one year md and he is a one year fellow he will be presenting two cases in cardiac ct and the other fellow with us today is dr prerna uh she's from jaipur she's come especially to learn uh, cardiac imaging with us and she's five years post md 
So without much ado, we'll begin with the first few cases. Um, so our, what we believe is that a good acquisition uh, means half of your work done. If you don't get a good image in cardiac imaging, uh, we'll spend half our time, you know, trying to guess work, what it is. So um, what is very essential is a good scan. Uh, so especially for congenital heart disease, suppose, the babies themselves are very small. We scan one day babies, two day babies. The babies themselves are small. So the heart is also smaller and the vessels are very tiny. So one, we need a good machine. And more than that, we need to um, proto make our protocol very uh, in such a way that we don't face problems while reporting. So one thing we uh, follow is we sedate the babies. Uh, it is just a short transvenous uh, uh, sedation, but for those one, two minutes, but uh, it really helps with the quality of the scan. Another thing we follow usually is we take two runs, a gated and a non-gated run. Uh, because what is essential in these congenital heart disease scans usually, the uh, clinicians are mainly interested in pulmonary arteries. They are interested in the coronaries uh, in most of the cases. And then depending on the indication, the uh, can we may tailor our protocol, but what we have found is that doing a one gated, first run gated, and a second run non gated answers usually all the questions that the clinicians have. Uh, so playing around with your machine, tailoring the protocol till you get really good images really helps in this case. So I'll, we'll first start with the case presentations and have a discussion later on. Please feel free to, I think, tap or type all your questions in the chat box. We'll answer them. Um, over you to, to you, Karthik, for the case presentation. Video on Akapri Narthan Day. Hello, am I audible? Yes, you are, Dr. Karthik. Please continue. So, uh, hello. So, good evening, everyone. I am Dr. Karthik. I am the fellow in uh, cardiac imaging in uh, Narayana. So, hope you all are doing well. So, I'll start. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank IRI Kerala for giving me this opportunity to present these cases. And I also would like to th uh, thank Dr. Risha and Dr. Vimal for their uh, guidance in presenting these amazing cases before you. So without much ado, I think I'll start presenting my presentation. So the presentation will go in such a way. I'll just give you a brief history, which will be followed by a DICOM image viewer, where I'll be showing you the cases, followed by a brief description of the condition in which I'm uh, describing the case. So I think I'll start. Uh, can I share my screen, ma'am? I have made you the co-host, uh, Dr. Karthik. So I think yes, you sir. will be able to share the screen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Is my screen visible? Yes. Yes, it's visible. Yes, ma'am. So the, I'll uh, straight on go to the first case. So the first case uh, presented with uh, was a nine-year-old child uh, who presented with uh, pain in the bilateral legs on exertion. And uh, the child also had dyspnea and easy fatigability. There was no history of any chest pain. So we'll go on to those images. So I'll, uh, first of all, I'll uh, start running through these images. So I let them run for around two to three times so that people get accustomed as to what is happening right there. And then I'll start describing the findings one by one. I'll run it once again. So there are two cases that I'll be presenting today. So one is a cyanotic heart disease and another one will be an acyanotic heart disease.
Okay, I'll be running it again, once again, for the people who are attending this webinar. Okay, so so here we have a baby who was a who was a child, a nine year old child who had come with uh, Disney on exertion and who also had the bilateral leg pain. So first of all, we usually follow this technique, what is called as following the contrast. So that is the easiest technique that is, and there is another technique which is called as the segmental uh, evaluation of the congenital heart disease, which I'll get to in the later part. So in this first part, as you can see, uh, the contrast here is being ex uh, ejected on the left side. The, the contrast is coming in through the left uh, uh, innominate vein, and then it goes on. And here we actually have a dual SVC. Here we can see that the patient has two SVCs actually. The other one is not very clear actually. This is the right-sided SVC and this is the left-sided SVC. And as we can see here, the contrast comes in through the left-sided SVC it drains into the coronary sinus, which is not very clear here. And then it goes on, this is the coronary sinus here. And then from there on, it drains into the right atrium. So from the right atrium, we can see the contrast draining into the right ventricle. And from the right ventricle, it goes on and drains into the RVOT. And from the RVOT, we can go on to the main pulmonary artery and into the branch pulmonary arteries, the right, the left, as we can see here, they're confluent. So from there, they go on to the lungs and from the lungs, they get drained into the pulmonary veins. As we can see here, we have the superior right pulmonary vein and the inferior right pulmonary vein. Similarly, we have one on the left, the superior left pulmonary vein and the inferior left pulmonary vein, which both of which can be seen draining into the left atrium and from the left atrium, they drain into the left ventricle. So from the left ventricle, we go on to the aorta proper. So from the left ventricle, as we can see, the contrast can be seen draining. This is the aortic root. And from here, we can see that the contrast is going into the ascending aorta. From the ascending aorta, it can be seen going into the arch. And from the arch, this is the arch here. And as we can see here, it goes down and there is a sudden narrowing of the caliber of the lumen of aorta. And from there on, as you can see here, there is a significant narrowing of the stenosis or coarctation as we can call it. And from there on, as we can see, this is the descending aorta. So the descending aorta goes down. So this is the simplest technique for in which we can analyze congenital heart diseases. So I'll run that again on the coronal sections. As we can see here, this is the aorta here. The aorta from the left ventricle, the ascending aorta, and then going on to the arch. Arch from we have the common right brachiocephalic artery, and then we have the left common carotid. And then we have the left subclavian artery. And post the left subclavian artery, we have a interruption. Rather than interruption, it is a severe coarctation of the aorta as you can see here. So, and then we have to assess for other things as well, such as we go on to assess the aorta, we assess for a PDA. We also look for any other associated findings that we can see, as we can see here, this here is the uh, right atrium and this is the left atrium and there's a flap like ASD, which can be seen here. And then we also have a uh, ventricular septal defect here, which is a subiotic BSD, which is seen here. So these are some of the associated findings. So summarizing my case again, I'll show this case, uh, I'll show the sagittal sections again. Just give me a minute. So here we have the sagittal reformations of the same. So I think it will be better visualized here. So as you can see here, I'll zoom in it a little bit. So here, as you can see, this is the uh, distal arch of the aorta, and there is a very small severe coarctation of the aorta, which is followed by a very small trickle of contrast, which can be seen going down into the descending aorta. And we also have we also have collaterals which are going in through the vertebral arteries, which help communicate the distal arch with the descending aorta. I think I'll now go on to my slides. Is my slideshow visible? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes so I'll go ahead with it. Okay. 
So we had a nine-year-old child who had pain in the bilateral exon exertion, dyspnea, and easy fatigability. So the pain can be explained by the rather lack of blood on exertion because there is a severe coarctation of the distal arch of aorta. So as we can see here, this is a empty. This is a uh, MIP image that I've taken, which shows the severe coarctation of the aorta that is seen here. And we take what is called as uh, Z scores of the aorta. So the most important thing in coarctation of aorta becomes the distance of the coarctation from the left subclavian artery, or rather the distance from a known marker, and the length of the coarctation. Uh, if it is a focal, we say it is a focal, or if it is a definitive length, when we mention the length of the coarctation. And also we take measurements of the aorta at various various levels, including the arch the distal aorta, and these are compared with normative values, and then we give them Z scores, which range from minus 2.5 to plus 2.5. So these are the Z scores that uh, were seen in this patient. So the patient had a severe coarctation, as you can see here. At the isthmus, it was very narrow. It was hardly around 1 mm. So this was, again, an NPR image. VR image of the same patient showing the severe coarctation of the aorta. So a brief description of the embryology of the uh, uh, aorta. So the aorta usually develops uh, from uh, two ventral and two dorsal arches. And of the two dorsal arches, the two ventral, between these dorsal and the ventral arches, uh, we have six pharyngeal aortic arches, which usually develop. And among the six uh, aortic arches, usually they regress, few of them regress and few of them persistently remain. So depending on that, we have various variants in the aortic arch anatomy, as well as the descending in the aortic anatomy. So the uh, most common variants that we come across are an aberrant left subclavian artery. We have right-sided aortic arches, and then we have the coarctation of the aorta, persistent ductus arteriosus. So these are some of the common conditions that we come across. And then going on to the next slide. So how do we uh, basically classify coarctation? So coarctation commonly is classified as pre-ductal, that is before the origin of the ductus arteriosus, or it can be ductal or post-ductal. And there is another classification as well which is uh, pre-ductal coarctation is usually called as an infantile type, which is usually severe. And there is another type which is called as a post-ductal type. The post-ductal type is also called as adult type and which is less severe and seen commonly in adults, as the name suggests. So usually the most common types are the ductal and the post-ductal types and the infantile type is relatively rare. And there is another entity that people should know, which is an interruption of the aortic arch, where there is complete interruption. Here we could see a small trickle of contrast, which could be seen going through. And uh, in interruption of arch, there is complete interruption. There is no communication whatsoever between the descending arch and the uh, and the descending uh, thoracic aorta and the arch of aorta. So that is called as the interruption of the arches. And I think the images are pretty much self-explanatory, as we can see here. There are three types commonly. So type C being the least common. And then uh, going on to the radiographic appearances of coarctation of aorta. First of all, we start with a routine radiographs. So on a radiographs, we get the classical, what is known as a figure of three sign, which occurs because of the, the initial part of the three is because of the pre-stenotic dilatation. And then we have a stenotic segment, which appears as the indentation in the three. And we again have the post-stenotic dilatation, which are, is the, the latter part of the three. And the other associated findings that we usually see is the inferior rib notching that is shown with arrows here that occurs because of the increased uh, vascular flow or increased blood flow through these uh, intercostal arteries, which usually um, bridge the um, uh, coarcted part that is from the arch to the distal thoracic iota. So because of the increased blood flow, there is erosion of the inferior aspect of the ribs, which is seen. And... Uh, Going on to the CT. So the important things that need to be reviewed on a CT includes the type of the coarctation from a surgical standpoint. And we need to mention the degree of narrowing, including the measurement, which is the pre-segment, pre-coarcted segment, the post and the stenosis segment, and also the visualization of collateral arteries, how good the collaterals are, and any associated cardiac anomalies, great vessel anomalies, or any lung abnormalities. So the surgical management of coarctation usually involves grafting. So we have resection and grafting and end-to-end -end anastomosis of the aorta. And then we have balloon angioplasty. And there is something called as a subclavian flap. So this is the surgical management. So before I go on to the next case, so I would like to go about the another, which is called as a segmental analysis of the congenital heart diseases. We have what is called as a Van Prague classification system in which we have three notations, which are usually described as SBS commonly. 
So the S, the first S here usually describes the visceral situs, uh, the visceral situs, and the next the notation, which is the D, usually commonly being D looping of ventricles, usually mentions the orientation of the ventricular loop, which can be of two types, namely, it can either be D looping or L looping. And the last being the situs of the or the position of the great vessels, which being the aorta and the uh, pulmonary artery. So the first notation can change between three values. It can either be a situs solitus, it can be situs inverses, or it can be situs ambiguous. The second notation can either be D looping or L looping. And the third one, similarly, situs solitus, it can be a normal relation or an inverted relation or something in between, which is called as malposition great arteries. So these are some of the images describing the same. So here we have a situs solitus or in which we have a trilobe lung on the right, a bilobe lung on the left. We have the uh, levocardia or the cardiac apex, which is facing towards the left, the liver on the right, and the spleen on the left. And in case of a situs inverses, there is complete inversion of all this. That is, we have a bilobed lung on the right, trilobe lung on the left, the cardiac apex pointing towards the left. We have a spleen on the right and a liver on the left. So something in between this is where is isomerism, where we have right-sided isomerism and left-sided isomerism. So anything which is neither uh, situs solitus or situs inverses, we usually label it as ambiguous with the notation A. And then we have what is called as D looping and L looping of the end ventricle. So the easier way to remember this is in D looping, the right ventricle is in the right, the left is ventricle is on the left. In L looping, it is usually inverted. The left ventricle is on the right and the right ventricle is on the left. So that is almost inverted. So that is the D looping of ventricles. And uh, here we have a diagram describing the uh, relation, the normal or the common relations of the great vessels. So this is the commonest relation between the aorta and the pulmonary valve and the aorta and the pulmonary artery. This is how the inverted one looks. And these are all the variants which come in between. So we usually describe them as either D malposition great arteries or an L malposition great arteries based upon the relations of the aortic valve and the pulmonary valve. So now going on to my next case. So my second case is that of a 14 day old child who had come for cyanosis and fast breathing. Uh, is my screen visible? Yes, doctor. Yes, so I'll first uh, run through the case once and then I'll start describing the findings. So you can use either the segmental analysis or the segmental analysis is used wide, worldwide for uh, uniformity in describing congenital heart diseases. The following the contrast is an easier method of going about describing your findings in a congenital heart disease. So I'll start running the case. So I'll run it once again. This is a pretty much straightforward case. You can start uh, using the segmental analysis that I just described, uh, the three notations that need to be looked for, and then you can follow the contrast. So one last time, I just run it quickly. So I'll start describing my findings. So as I said before, so first we look for the visceral situs. So here we have a situs solitus where the liver is on the right, the spleen is on the left. And if you go a little ahead, we have the apex of the cardiac apex, which is on the facing towards the left. And if I can adjust the window a little bit. And 
show you the coronary reconstructions. Yeah. So here, as you can see here, this is the E arterial and the hyper arterial bronchus. Here we have a trilobed right lung and a bilobed left lung. So going on to the, is the image clear? Okay, I'll start describing my findings right now. So we just described that the liver is on the right. So we have a visceral situs and here we have the de-looping of the ventricles where the, how do we find out is the right ventricle is we usually follow the contrast as I said before. So here we have the contrast coming into the SVC and from the SVC, if you follow it downwards, it goes and drains into the right atrium and the right atrium, as we can see, it is draining into the right ventricle. So the right ventricle is to the right of the left ventricle. So this is the de-looping of ventricles. And then we go on to see the relationship of the great arteries. As we can see, the relationship between the iota and the pulmonary is as it should be in a situs, in a normally related great arteries. So this is a normal relation. So we can notate it as S. So now as we were following the contrast, so the right atrium draining into the right ventricle. And from the right ventricle, it is supposed to drain into the pulmonary artery. So as we can see here, it is going into the pulmonary artery. However, we have a severe stenosis, which I'll show it to you in the sagittal reformations where it will be better visualized. So as you can see here, this is the right ventricle and this is the right ventricular outflow tract and this is the pulmonary artery here. So there is a severe stenosis at the level of the infundibulum. The infant, this is the part of the RVOT where there is severe stenosis and there is resultant right ventricular hypertrophy. And uh, then going on to the other findings and from there we go to the pulmonary artery and from the pulmonary artery, we have confluent branch pulmonary arteries. The pulmonary arteries are draining into the lungs and from there they drain into the pulmonary veins. As we can see the right pulmonary veins and the left pulmonary vein and the left the pulmonary veins are seen draining into the left atrium from the left atrium into the left ventricle and from there on into the aorta but at the level of the aorta we can see that the aorta receives flow from both the right ventricle and the left ventricle as well along with a ventricular septal defect which can be seen here and then the aorta continues forward to the ascending aorta the arch of aorta and into the descending aorta. So summarizing my findings once again, we have a severe pulmonary stenosis, severe infundibular stenosis with uh, underlying right ventricular hypertrophy. And we have uh, overriding of the iota, which receives flow from both the right ventricle as well as the left ventricle because of a VSD. So Putting it all together, this is a case of tetralogy of fallow. So I'll go back to my presentation. Is my screen visible? Yes, it is. Yes. So summarizing my case once again. So these were the primary cardinal features that were seen in my case, which being RVOT or the infundibular stenosis, which was seen with the underlying right ventricular hypertrophy which is seen here. And then we had the overriding of the aorta where it can be seen draining from both the right ventricle as well as the left ventricle along with the ventricular septal defect. And the ventricular septal defect can be seen much better in the third image here. There's a defect here. So this was a case of a cyanotic heart disease, which being tetralogy of fallow. So tetralogy of fallow, as I said before, cyanotic congenital heart disease where the four main Cardinal features for diagnosis are, which start with the narrowing of the pulmonary valve or the infundibular stenosis at the level of the RVOT and with an underlying resultant thickening of the right ventricular wall or the right ventricular hypertrophy. And there is usually a ventricular septal defect, which is usually subbiotic in nature. And the aorta usually, which is mal aligned and receives supply from both the uh, right ventricle as well as the left ventricle, because of which there is a shunting of blood. And this is a comparison between a normal heart and a uh, heart which has tetralogy of fallow. As you can see here, the pulmonary, uh, the RVOT or the infundibulum is wide enough here. Otherwise, as in comparison, it is 
narrowed, severely stenosed in case of a tetralogy of fallow. And there is an overriding of the iota where it receives flow from both the right ventricle as well as the left ventricle. So some of the genetic associations, a small brief discussion, uh, description about TOF. So usually the incidence is around 0.06% of live birth and it constitutes about 5 to 7% of all the congenital heart diseases usually associated with Downs. And it is also usually associated with Vactorl and Chart syndrome. So the main importance of TOF being it is one of the common, very commonly diagnosed congenital heart diseases. And usually these children live to adulthood. So increasing the prevalence of tetralogy of fallow in adults and usually because of which we find a lot of adults who have tetralogy of fallow. And uh, the associated findings that we need to be looking for in case of a tetralogy of fallow include the commonest being right-sided aortic arch. As I said, there'll be associated findings. The commonest being a right-sided aortic arch with a mirror image branching, which is seen in around 25% of the patients. They have aberrant subclavian arteries. Uh, and the stenosis of the pulmonary artery can range from a mild pulmonary stenosis to pulmonary atresia, where there is complete stenosis. And sometimes it is completely even absent. And there are coronary artery anomalies are also very commonly associated with TOF. So the coronary artery anomalies that usually need, uh, need to be looked out for because um, we look for what is called as a coronary arteries crossing the uh, anterior to the RVOT, which I'll be showing an image of. So during the surgery for TOF, they usually tend to put a radial incision, which might tend to damage the coronary artery. So we need to look out for the coronary artery anomalies as well. So on the imaging aspect, we need to evaluate for the confluence of the pulmonary arteries, whether they are confluent, non-confluent, atretic or hypoplastic. And then we need to establish the positions of the coronary arteries. Like I just mentioned, we need to look for aortopulmonary collaterals. The aortic anatomy, again, like I said, that should usually is associated with a right-sided aortic arch. So, and another important thing that needs to be mentioned in most uh, TOF patients is what is called as a Meguns ratio. So Meguns ratio is usually, uh, we get it from the uh, dimensions of the uh, distal right pulmonary artery, distal left pulmonary artery, which is usually divided by the diameter of the aorta at the diaphragm. So the values usually range anywhere from one point, uh, the value should usually be more than two, but anything above 1.7 is acceptable. The importance of Meguns being anything less than 1.5, usually they tend to go in for palliative surgical procedures rather than definitive surgical procedures. Going on to my next case, there are, these are a few images describing how a coronary, this is a coronary, which can be seen here, which is crossing the ant, anterior to the RVOT. So the importance here becomes is that during the surgery, they tend to put an incision here. So which can uh, bisect the coronary artery. So they need to be mentioned. And the next part is major iotopulmonary collaterals, which is MAPCAS. So in case of pulmonary atresia and even in severe pulmonary stenosis, the mechanism by which these uh, children usually survive is that they develop collaterals from directly from the aorta, which are of pretty big caliber. So they are called as major iotopulmonary collateral arteries. And then, as I said, again, aortic uh, variants, we get what is called as a right-sided aortic arch, which is uh, like the aortic arch is usually to the right of the trachea. If it is to the left of the trachea, we call it as a left-sided aortic arch. And then we also have aberrant subclavian arteries, as I just said. So this is an aberrant left subclavian artery, which is having a retroesophageal course, as it can be seen here, retro tracheal and a retroesophageal course here. So these are some of the commonest anomalies, or the commonest associations with a tetralogy of fallow. So the corrective surgery, as I mentioned again, is usually involves the resection and enlargement of the RVOT or the infundibular stenosis and usually closure of the VSD by using a transannular patch. Thank you. Karthik can stop sharing the screen. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Karthik. That was a good presentation. Thank you. Um, so we have one question, which I'll just take up. Uh, before that, I just want to summarize what he said. So, um, for reporting congenital heart disease, uh, we are very scared. Why are we scared? Because there's a fear that we might miss something. So to avoid that, uh, the easiest way is to develop a protocol of your own, whichever is most convenient to you. You might go outside to inside, inside to outside. So like Karthik said, we follow the flow of contrast. So basically we tend to not miss out any structure. So we go from the SVC, right atrium, right ventricle, we see the septum in between, 
pulmonary arteries, pulmonary veins, left atrium, left ventricle, aorta. We end up seeing everything. And then lung windows. So we see the lungs, bones, and we are done. Right? So you can develop your own protocol if that helps, whatever helps. Um, another thing, uh, I'll just summarize both the cases. Tetralogy of fallow is the commonest congenital heart disease. But echo is quite good enough. Why would a clinician send to you for a cardiac CT? Because these babies are small, they have a very good window uh, for echocardiography. All cases will not come for CT MRI. Very few cases will come. So we have to be very careful what the clinician wants from us. First and foremost, most important for them to decide the further management is the pulmonary artery size, like Karthik said, McGoon's ratio. So that decides the further management. If the pulmonary arteries are not big enough, they will not go ahead and do an intracardiac repair. Uh, they will first try and make the increase the blood flow to the lungs. So they may do a BT shunt or they might put a PDA stent or whatever, depending on the patient. So first and foremost, the information they need is the pulmonary artery size and whether they are confluent or not. So that's where the McGoon's ratio comes in. Second thing they need uh, is the coronary artery anatomy. In that, the important thing is, is, is there a major coronary crossing RVOT? Because then they need to change their surgical approach. Uh, otherwise, intraop, they will find out there's a major coronary crossing RVOT and they totally cause the radiologist. Third important thing is the MAPCAS. We need to describe the MAPCAS origin and course and how many they are exactly because they need to decide if they need to operate on them. And there's something called uh, unifocalization of the MAPCAS which the surgeons do. They need to decide whether they need to do that or not. So we need to describe each and every collateral in detail. This is rep reporting for preoperative TOFs. So we have a question that says explain overriding of aorta. So normally aorta arises from the LV, right? But in tetralogy of fallow, there is a malaligned ventricular septal defect. So the aorta kind of is sitting on top of the defect. So it appears as if it's overriding the defect and it drains both the ventricles. That's what's called overriding of aorta. Um, so if it's less than 50%, it usually goes towards tetralogy of fallow. If the overriding is more towards the right ventricle, we have to start thinking in terms of double outlet right ventricle. Okay. Uh, regarding the other case, coarctation, uh, like he said, what is most important is the um, coarctation, what's its size, and um, how distant is it from the left subclavian artery for them to decide the further management. What we do is give something called Z-scores or Z-scores. Uh, that is nothing but an objective measurement, okay? So we don't need to subjectively say, oh, it's severe or it's not severe, no. We give them the scores. They can see in numbers objectively that whether it's severe or not because uh, these are child's of all ages, right? How do you know what is normal for that child? So Z-score is nothing but comparison with normal, uh, the vessel size comparison with the normal child, or, uh, no, uh, normal child of the same age. Uh, so we'll now move on to our next uh, cases, MR. We are doing two cases in cardiac MR. Um, Cardiac MR, uh, what, how, what's the importance in day-to-day -day life? I'll be taking in my next talk. Uh, but the commonest indications in cardiac MRI is uh, to find out viability and for high, uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. My fellow will explain in her subsequent case presentations. I call upon Prerna. Prerna, please come. Prerna is our uh, another fellow with us. She's from Jaipur. She's come to us to learn cardiac imaging. Uh, she's five years post MD. She'll be to dis uh, describing two cases in uh, cardiac MRI. What do you pray now? Is my screen screen? Can you see my screen? Uh, it's still Karthik's presentation. Okay. Now is it visible? Yeah, yeah, it's there. yeah. Okay. Good evening, everyone. I am Dr. Prerna Singh. I'm a fellow in cardiac imaging in Narayana Health City. And uh, I would first of all like to thank you all for giving me such a good opportunity. And uh, especially to ICA, uh, IRA Kerala. And uh, the last but not least, I would be really thankful to Dr. Richard Ma'am and Dr. Vimal, sir, to always guide me through this. So now moving on to my presentation. Uh, 
cardiac MRI. I'll be not going into the depth and giving you very straight away two cases. Uh, being the most common uses being CMR, that is cardiac MR in viability, and cardiac MR in HCM, that is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I'll start with a short introduction, being that uh, some images, these are not orthogonal planes, which we usually talk about in cardiac MRI, and then I'll move on to those straightforward cases. Now, viability, the viability term as such encompasses what is alive, but in myocardial viability, it is not what is alive. It is the part which is that which has the contractile recovery uh, and ventricular dysfunction, which will improve when you revascularize it. So differing this from the other part is that in viability, we only talk about life, but in myocardium, we will talk about what we have potential to recover back when we treat that part. So the viability is of very great importance for the management of these patients to whether go for revascularization, what we can revert back is viable. Now, what are the roles of MR? We, uh, when we talk about roles of MR, it can range from acute MI to chronic MI. In acute myocardial infarction, along with viability, we also talk about edema. In chronic myocardial infarction, when we are dealing with a chronic ischemic cardiomyopathy, we can tell the amount of infarction affecting, which may alter the treatment on the course of the patient, in which we can either go for revascularization or we can go for an optimal medical therapy. We can stratify risk by uh, telling them the amount of scar burden, which can also tell them the areas of arrhythmias can be explained and also for revascularization. We can predict the response to the therapy in the post-revascularization cases. And also we can detect complications like aneurysm and thrombosis. Now, first I'll give you the most common views used in cardiac MRIR, two chamber, also known as vertical long axis, four chamber, also called horizontal long axis and short axis view. In two chamber view, we can see the left atrium and left ventricle. In the four chamber view, we can see the left side of the heart and right side being left atrium, left ventricle, right atrium, right ventricle. And in the short axis view, we can see the myocardial, uh, thickened my, uh, myocardium around the left ventricle and thin out right ventricle. So this is a normal morphological images in a patient. Now, the beauty of cardiac MRI is that not only we see the images, we can also functionally assess them. Now, we can see the myocardium moving and the contractility along the anterior and inferior wall. Similarly, we can see the functional assessment of the right ventricle, right atrium, left atrium, left ventricle, the septum and the valvular regions of mitral and tricuspid valve. And this is how we assess the more the regional wall motion of the right, left ventricle. And accordingly, we guide them in which they can see the hypokinesis, akinesis. The most important sequences when we talk about viability is late gadolinium enhancement. It is an imaging done after five to seven, uh, seven minutes of giving contrast. The basic principle for this image is in that gadolinium is an extracellular uh, uh, contrast and which tends to retain in extracellular spaces. So in a normal myocardium, the myocardial cells are intact. So they'll be uh, washing out of the contrast sooner. However, when we have a pathological areas of a uh, disrupted cell membrane, as we see in myocardial infarctions or the delay, the complications of fibrosis in the extracellular space, this contrast will retain. So why, that is why these sequences are the most important to give the fibrotic scar the scar burdens. These are the normal myocardial images, also known as myocardial lulling, where we can see the uniform blackness of the myocardium, which are taken in the left gadolinium enhancement. Moving to the 17 segment model uh, by American Heart Association, they divide the left ventricle cavity in basal, mid and apical region. The basal and mid cavity are divided in six segment each. The importance of this distribution is to find a territorial distribution of the three major arteries of the heart, being LAD, RCA, and LCX. The LAD gets the anterior and enteroseptal regions. The LCX gets the lateral walls, and RCA gets the inferior walls. Although there may be an overlap of the distribution, being that the dominance, depending on the dominance of the circulatory system, 
but following this 17 segment we can guide towards which territory we are talking about and which vessel is to be revascularization revascularized or which vessel we can go for therapy now the major question in viability is the that what are we dealing with when we had in myocardium which has gone under ischemia now how to say it is viable or not there are three main factors which we'll be seeing in the, our case the myocardial thickness, the thinning of myocardium suggests fibrosis, chronic ischemia leading to fibrotic areas. This is a contractile aterism, how well it contracts. It can be hypokinesis, that is, it is still viable, but contracting less to the other parts of the uh, areas of myocardium. And the last, the most important being the scar imaging, that is the how much of myocardium is showing delayed enhancement. So when we talk about delayed enhancement, it can vary from the area of thickness of the myocardium involved. It can be up to 25, 50%, 75, or more than 75. As you can see, this is a null myocardium. This is less than 25% of area. This is a 50% area, and this is up to 75. And this is a near transmural term used when we see nearly the whole of the myocardium is involved. Now coming the question, uh, generally when we see up to 50% is thought to be viable. It is hypokinetic and viable. Everything brought in together, up to 50% is considered viable. More than 75% or transmural is non-viable. Now the question for the 51 to 75% arises on when we go back to the motion uh, contractility reserve. If it is hypokinetic, we can label it as viable. If it is akinetic, thinned out, we label it as non viable Now, the case, very simple, straightforward case. It was a 52-year-old man who was diabetic and hypertensive. He had an anterior wall MI two months back. Now, this is a two-chamber image and this is a four-chamber image. We can see the right side of the heart is doing well. In the left side, in the left side, we can see some dilated, the ventricle appears dilated and there is less motion of the anterior wall and the apex. There's secondary finding of localized pericardial effusion. Dividing the same segments in the three parts, the basal, mid and apical. We can appreciate that these myocardiums are moving well, but this myocardium along the enteroseptum is not moving that well with a thinned out area. Similarly, moving on to the mid cavity, we can well appreciate the lateral wall and inferior wall moving well, but the enteroseptal and anterior segments are not moving with thinned out areas. Similarly, in the apical region, the septum and the anterior wall are again lagging behind and thin and akinesis. Thin and akinesis of the anterior segment. Now, comparing to our findings to the late gadolinium enhancement, there was thinning and hypokinesis, severe hypokinesis, I would say, along the enteroseptal segment. The corresponding area shows near transmural infarction. The mid cavity, similarly thin myocardium with severe hypokinesis, and it is transmural infarction. And similarly, the apical cavity along the anterior and septal segment. The apex, which is not visualized in short axis, was thinned out, which we saw in the four chamber view and corresponding late cadoridium enhancement, we can see the near transmural infarction of the apex with that partial volume area of the septum. So our report would go like, out of 17 segments, six are non-viable, being basal enteroseptum, mid enteroseptum and mid anterior, apical anterior segment and apical septum and apex. Now, what is the importance of these? The most important predictor for a successful outcome after revascularization procedure is the presence of scarring. There's an inverse relationship for the scar that is more than 75% is thought to be non-viable and less likely to recover after revascularization. The scars are the, also the substrate of arrhythmia, which might explain the causes in these patients. And concluding in our case, more than 75% segmental hyperenhancement suggests non-viable infarcted tissue with little to no potential for functional improvement after revascularization. Moving on to the case number two, 
which is again a common indication for cardiac MRI, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, a short introduction. It is a genetic cardiac disease. The most important differential here is that it is a diffuse or segmental left ventricular hypertrophy, which is non-dilated and hyperdynamic chamber in the absence of another cardiac or systemic disease. So differential from the left ventricular hypertrophy are excluded being a genetic disease. It is producing a mag the, which can, the other diseases cannot explain the magnitude of this hypertrophy. Most, it is a most common cause of death among young patients and symptoms may vary according to the area involved in the thickening and any other associated obstructive changes, which can be dyspnea, syncope, or sudden cardiac death. The other term which we get familiar to is that HOCM. The only difference between HCM and HOCM is that when the HCM presents with obstructive changes along the left ventricular outflow, outflow tract or along the mid cavity, it is termed as HOCM. We can also find the right ventricular involvement, which can cause right ventricular outflow tract obstructions. Morphologically, the different types of uh, HCM will depend on the area involved. It can be focal, asymmetrical, focal septal leading to LVOT obstruction. It can be uh, asymmetrical septal, an apical variant, a concentric form, mid cavity form a mass-like or multicentric. So depending on the wall involved, it can be concentric, asymmetrical, or focal involvement. Now the diagnosis is any myocard maximum myocardial thickness to diagnose an HCM is more than 15 mm in end diastolic phase. The obstructive peak velo uh, gradient, uh, pressure gradient along the LVOT or mid cavity will be more than 30 mm of Hg, which is usually measured on echo. And apical HCM, well, the thickness will again be of 15 mm of the apex. Now, what is the role of imaging of CMR? We help in diagnosing the case. We also can, this can also, being a genetic condition, it can also be used for screening. It is used for treatment planning, guiding the various morpho associated morphological changes in the uh, HCM patients, like example, in LVOT obstruction, we would tell about the papillary muscles and mitral valve pathologies. There's associated secondary complications, the fibrotic burdens, and then we prognostication. There are few factors which we use for prognosticating the case, the being, some being LV wall thickness of more than 30 mm or three centimeters is a poor prognostic marker. The gradient along the LVOT more than 30 mm is again a uh, obstructive feature. Delayed enhancement representing fibrosis, so more than 15% of fibrotic burden, and ejection fraction less than 50, which is also known as burnt out phase. Moving to our case, he's a 66 year old male who was diabetic and hypertensive. He presented with syncope and breathlessness after ruling out the coronary artery disease with a normal CT coronary angiography. The echo showed features of LV hypertrophy. He was advised cardiac MRI for further evaluation. Now, this is two chamber view, short axis, and a four chamber view. We can appreciate the thickened myocardium, which is best labeled in the short axis view. It is a concentric form, and the movement is, however, the contractility appears normal. So, the hypertrophy was 23 mm, meeting a criteria of more than 15 mm. This was the thickness. This is how we take it in end diastolic phase. Normal uh, my, my, uh, myocardial thickness is up to 13 mm. In this normal case, we can see it is 7.2 in diastolic phase. And in our case, it was 23 mm. Moving to the common complications of the obst uh, HCM being HOCM, that is obstructive. This is a normal three chamber view where we can see the mitral valve moving and a gush of blood along the aortic valve. Now, in HOCM, there is anterior motion of the mitral leaflet leading to narrowing of the LVOT tract, which is known as left ventricular outlet tract obstruction. And we can well appreciate a flow acceleration jet in the subaortic region, differentiating it from an aortic valve pathology. The associated secondary changes we can see because of the anterior drag effect, we can see the mitral regurgitation jet 
which is not nothing but non uh, the both the mitral leaflets are not opposed because of the anterior drag effect and there's an eccentric jet the secondary changes can also be seen along the right ventricle in fundibular region. This is a normal right ventricular tract with no obvious flow acceleration. However, in our case, there was infundibular hypertrophy leading to flow acceleration jet in RVOT. This is a late gadolinium enhancement image. This is a normal nulled out myocardium. And this is, we can see some white areas, patchy white areas along the mid myocardium along the septum. So this is patchy mid myocardial fibrosis or, or we can say enhancement on the late gadolinium images. So summarizing our findings, we saw the type of HCM. It is circumferential hypertrophy with maximum thickness of 23 mm. We saw the obstruction along the left ventricular outflow tract with an eccentric mitral jet or regurgitation of regurgitation. We saw a jet along the right ventricular outlet tract with thickened infundibular region. There was patchy mid-myocardial enhancement along the septum, and we could see enhancing papillary muscles, also an indicator for fibrosis. So diagnosis was hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Differential in our cases, being a hypertensive patient, he can also develop overloading condition, that is hypertensive right ventricular hypertrophy, but hypertensive left ventricular hypertrophy rarely exceeds more than 15 mm in thickness. It is not associated with obstructive features. It does not involve the right ventricle. And usually, we see no post gadolinium enhancement. Other differential conditions can be overloading, then again, secondary to athlete's heart or aortic stenosis. They can be infiltrative diseases, example, amyloidosis and Fabry's disease. Finally, the treatment for these patients will incline the complications which you are facing. They can either be having arrhythmia secondary to fibrosis or they can have outlet LVOT obstructive features. So the lifestyle changes with uh, asking them to exert less to keep a low heart rate so that the filling happens being a diastolic failure, the filling happens properly, the left ventricle fills properly. The genetic counseling of the patient uh, because being an uh, inherited disorder and genetic disorder then we can go for when in the obstructive features, we can go for uh, percutaneous alcohol septal ablations or surgical myomectomy. And uh, with arrhythmias are treated with a implantable defibrillators. Thank you. Thank you, Prerna, for the excellent case presentation. So basically what he's presented today are two of the most prominent indications we come across uh, while practicing cardiac MRI. Uh, why, why HCM? One, it's the commonest cause of death, especially in young uh, individuals. So um, that's why we scan cardiac MR. Uh, so what the clinician wants from us is, what's the degree of the myocardial thickness? and what's the fibrotic burden, and if there are any other complications. That helps them decide the further management, whether the patient needs to undergo surgery or non-surgical management, whether he needs um, uh, ICD, intracardiac devices, to avoid arrhythmia and sudden cardiac death. So that's HCM. Viability, uh, why we need to do, uh, what the clinician wants from us is, uh, whether tissue is viable or not viable, that helps him decide whether the patient needs to undergo revascularization or not. If a patient had an anterior wall MI and a large LED infarct, and the tissue is already non-viable, there is no ahead in going ahead and doing a revascularization like a stenting or a CABG. There are, I think, a couple of questions. I'll just take it. How to differentiate between amyloidosis and HCM? So on cardiac MR, uh, the main uh, sequence which helps us differentiate is low gadolinium enhancement sequence. HCM will have a typical patchy uh, mid myocardial uh, fibrosis enhancement. Amyloidosis, depending on what type of amyloidosis it is, whether it's AL or ATTR, uh, it might have a very smooth, diffuse subendocardial enhancement, or it might have a very irregular, diffuse near transmural enhancement. So basically the pattern of enhancements are completely different. That is one thing which helps us. 
Second thing, there might be associated pericardial pleural effusions in amyloidosis with mitral dilatation and uh, mitral tricuspid valve regurgitation. That is another point. Third point is there are newer parametric uh, mapping techniques. So T1 mapping um, in HCM will be slightly raised. Like if I tell for our center, the normal values is 1250. HCM will be somewhere around 1300, 1350, but amyloidosis will be very high. It will be around 1400, 1500, 1600, like that. So in patients, CKD, suppose we cannot give gadolinium, we use the Steven mapping techniques in addition to other features to help in diagnosing amyloidosis. Another question is, is RVOT flu acceleration seen when HCM involves RV or also when just LV is involved? Flu acceleration is nothing but an artifact which we are using for diagnosis. Okay, so in cardiac MRI, um, basically each and every company has different ways, but um, uh, there's something which we call shimming. So as we know, heart is a very dynamic structure, right? It's continuously pumping blood. It doesn't stop for cardiac MRI. So when we see a cine, cine image, the ventricles contract, the uh, valves open up, the blood goes into ventricles, ventricles contract, blood goes into aorta. So if we don't adjust the velocities while scanning MRI properly, we will see flow acceleration in every scan. So it's like a Doppler, right? If you don't adjust your uh, frequencies and velocities, you will see aliasing in every scan, in every artery. So we adjust our velocities in such a way in Doppler so that we get aliasing only when there is stenosis, right? Similarly, in um, cardiac MRI, we adjust the velocities of the regular scans in such a way that we get flow acceleration only when there is stenosis. If that is not adjusted properly, uh, you will wrongly diagnose it as stenosis. So to answer your question, we will see flow acceleration wherever there is stenosis, whether it's RVOT or LVOT. Please elaborate sequences used in Narayana for cardiac MRI. So cardiac, uh, sequences for cardiac MR basically stay the same everywhere, whether it's Narayana or any other institution. Uh, there is always cine sequences. The view, the brain already showed you there's two chamber view, four chamber view, short axis view. So cine is to far functional assessment. We need to see how well the heart is moving. Secondly, so that is the functional assessment. Then we need to do uh, something morphological assessment like every other MRI in the body, right? There's something after contrast, we see brain, we see liver. Similarly, we see the heart. But in the heart, we call it late gadolinium enhancement. So we take it seven to eight minutes after contrast. So these are the two most important sequences, cine image sequences and late gadolinium enhancement sequences, which are done in every case. Then based on what the indication is, we will change and add a new sequences like you saw in HCM, we added something called a three chamber sequence, right? To have a look at the LVOT obstruction. So similarly, we keep adding sequences based on the indication. Um, I cannot talk about every indication right now, but uh, in for, for further lectures, we'll talk about that. So what we saw today, the four cases are some of the commonest cases you will encounter while reporting cardiac imaging. Uh, what is very important for us is good quality image scans, whether it's cardiac MRI or cardiac CT. Uh, formalize your protocol, personalize your protocol so that you get good quality images. Very important to know what the clinician wants in a particular scan, because if we don't tell them what they want, they won't send us patients for cardiac imaging. Uh, one last thing from the theory point of view for the residents. Uh, They've started asking a lot of cardiac MR every year, like a couple of years back, there's a question on late gadolinium enhancement and viability. So similarly, basically, you just need to know from theory point of view, um, how, the, how each disease looks on late gadolinium enhancement, etiology and pathogenesis of it. Uh, from um, congenital heart disease, they've been asking situs looping, which uh, Karthik covered in his talk. There's a question on SDS, the situs and looping of ventricles and the relation of great arteries. So you all need to know that. And lastly, I would like to thank... Um, yeah. Richa, can I ask one question? Yes, please, ma'am. And during your viability study, do you use perfusion? Study? Uh, so we, uh, we get a lot of uh, requests for perfusion for stress MRI. So that is ischemia studies. So in those cases, we add on one more sequence for stress MRI, where we give adenosine to the patient and then take EPI uh, perfusion images very quickly, where one heartbeat, we take one image 
and we try to get a perfusion study. But in case of viability, whether we don't want no. ischemia or a perfusion study, okay. we just give contrast and it is as good as a rest perfusion, but it's not a stress perfusion. Yeah, that's correct. So how often you do this uh, stress study? Do you do with dopamine or you that you know say? Uh, so our commonest indication in our institute is uh, adenosine stress. On an average, we do six to seven or seven to eight per day, uh, adenosine stress MRIs. Um, we do do dobutamine stress MRI. Actually, I have a question also about that. Dobutamine uh. can be used for stress MRI. We do dobutamine stress MRI, but not as often as adenosine. Yeah, it's more risky. We do it in CKD patients where we don't want to give contrast. Uh, the reason is multifold. Actually, it takes longer, but not just that. Um, adenosine has a very strong last uh, ten seconds. Yeah. So if some it has, it has a very good safety profile. If something goes wrong, we stop adenosine. Patient is perfectly fine. Dobutamine, yeah. that's not the case. If I stress the patient using dobutamine, there's a chance I push him into failure and yeah. acute mind. And we have to watch the patient also. We need a yes. cardiologist close to. Yeah. Do you so have a Sorry. Do you have a cardiologist close to you when you do this uh, adenosine stress test? Have so a team? Are, uh, uh, this whole building is the cardiac building. So there's always someone close by. But as a protocol in our department, all of us are uh, ACLS certified. So we only stress. Uh, we can deal with all the complications. So usually the because the first couple of minutes are very important even by the team response. So uh, we make sure we or any fellows who come, we are all trained. Uh, so okay. still the response team comes, uh, we manage the patient. So we are certified that way. But yes, we have someone close by. But not standby. If we call, they'll come. Like that. Very, very good. It was an absolute very good uh, study. And the students also did very well, Karthika and Prayer. Okay. Exactly. Oh, what you was, yes, mm -hmm. thank you, ma'am. That was a wonderful session. Like ma'am already mentioned, there were amazing cases and I mentioned already we don't see a lot of them. And you have given such valid and practical points, even Dr. Karthik and Dr. Perna and Dr. Richa, when you were discussing the cases, practical points, valid points, which we are not very familiar because of lack of experience of seeing the cases also. And the way you moderated sessions, taking up even the last bit of dobutamin question, which I thought will get missed out. You were like, you know, keeping your eye out on the tap. It was excellent on the whole, the entire, the PGs and Dr. Richard. Thank you so much. And um, so uh, going on directly into the vote of thanks part, I would especially like to thank Dr. Richa Kothari for taking time for this uh, session, for moderating the session, guiding the fellows. And especially because I know she's between her duty and she has uh, did some internal adjustments and some tweaks. She'll have to stay some extra time because she spent this an hour or more with us right now. So thank you so much. You are very supportive about it. I would like to uh, th uh, thank uh, her PGs or fellows rather, Dr. Prerna and Dr. Tartik, because they presented uh, such amazing cases and that too at such a short notice. I had practically not given them a lot of uh, time to do all these preparations. And in the background scene, there is, I would like to thank Dr. Vimal Raj because he's the one who connected me to Dr. Richa and Dr. Sanjay Yadav who connected me to Dr. Vimal Raj. So it was an entire process. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Gomati Subramaniam, ma'am, uh, our Kerala State IRI president, a super enthusiastic academician who pushes <laughs> us and practically the driving force behind all our academics in Kerala IRA. Dr. Rijo, sir, he had just joined a moment ago, but I don't see him in the list anymore. So um, he's always, you know, there supporting us, guiding us. Dr. Ramesh Shinoy, sir, he's our program coordinator and always there with us as our digital guru and supporting and guiding us at every step. Dr. Venu, sir, who is our... Um, and who was supposed to be with us again, and our entire team of academic coordinators for making all these sessions happen seamlessly. And these events would never be fruitful without our audience, our PGs, and the radiologists who are viewing us. So hope you continue to support us and benefit from our sessions. Thank you, Med Piper team, for providing us this wonderful platform, especially Ms. Soumya and Mr. Trivedi for coordinating this entire thing for us. And at the end of it, Dr. Gomati, ma'am, with your permission, if it's all right, yeah. we can end the session. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. So on behalf of Med Piper and Genomet, also, I would like to thank all the speakers for this wonderful session. And I'm sure all the attendees have benefited out of it.
and uh, hopefully they can get more such sessions in the future so thank you everyone